I'm really um, thankful for this opportunity to, to share a lot of things, you know, over the years, because the case, the so-called Son of Sam case, was a very high profile and it was reported around the world. And, and you know, so many people got involved in the thing. Uh, there's been so many misunderstandings and misinformation that have come down over the years. Uh, but I just want to tell my story in my own words, and this is David talking. I'm just talking now to share what's on my heart, what's on my mind, uh, to bring clarity to certain things. I can't talk about everything. I don't want to talk about the crimes specifically. There's no reason to. That's all been discussed before. Anybody who wants to learn about them can go on in the internet or whatever and watch whatever they watch, or read whatever they read. But uh, for me, this is my story. This is David talking. Uh, again, 39 years in prison, and I'm, I'm sharing my heart now, and you can take or leave whatever I say. But um, I was born in 1953 in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, of course, I didn't know it at the time, but I was uh, adopted. I was adopted at birth uh, by a Jewish couple, Nathan and Pearl Berkowitz, who lived in the Bronx. And the Bronx is where I grew up. Even though I was born in Brooklyn, uh, several days or a week after I was born, while I was in the hospital in Brooklyn, you know, my adoptive parents, of course, picked me up. This was all prearranged, and they took me to their home in the Bronx where, where I grew up. My birth parents, I later learned, I didn't find this out till many, many years later, actually when I was in my early 20s, that my birth parents, my mother's name was Rebecca Broder. She was a, from a religious Jewish family, uh, living, you know, growing up in Brooklyn. And my dad's name was Joseph Kleinman. He was a, uh, an, also a Jewish man and who had a family of his own. Uh, my birth mother at, at um, this is before I was born, my birth mother had, at the advice of the family not to, she married a Gentile guy. Back then, in, in I guess the 1940s, and when this happened, and again, this is before I was born, the rule of thumb was you, you married your own kind, and, and especially if you come from a, a, a conservative Jewish family, her, I guess, parents were, you know, from Europe, they immigrated with so many others, they immigrated from Hungary to, to the United States. When she was started dating an Italian guy, <laughs> and it was a Gentile, the family was very upset. But she, you know, she, a, strong, a headstrong woman, she married him anyway, and he, they opened up a fish store in what was then Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It was Falco's Fish Market. And uh, they ended up having a child who later I would learn would be my half-sister, Rosalyn. Now, I wasn't even born yet, so this is well before my time, but I'm giving you the background. And anyway, uh, within a, about a year or so after they married and after uh, Betty gave birth to, to my half-sister, Rosalyn, this fellow, Tony, took off with another woman and was never seen or heard from since. The store, the little store went out of business and my mother was left to fend for herself. Uh, some of the family stuck with, stuck with her, other family members rejected her because she had betrayed the family. She was the proverbial black sheep of the family having married a Gentile guy and upset her parents and made her parents sick and on and on. The typical story that happens all the time. You know, it's not something shocking, and it, you know, but it's sad. Anyway, she, she fend, tried to fend for herself. She had an apartment. She kept a, a small, modest apartment in Brooklyn, and she kept the name of her husband, Falco, because she was still legally married, even though by this time he had been gone for 10 years. Because he had abandoned her, she had to get, have income in some way, so she was living on welfare and trying to raise her daughter as best as she could. She was a loving mom, a sweet person, and it was a real struggle for her. Over time, she met a man by the name of you know, Mr. Kleinman, who uh, saw that she was single and living alone, and one thing led to another, and they ended up uh, having like an affair. It's a common thing, and uh, while well, he had his own family, and this affair lasted more than 20 years, actually, and the family act families actually knew about it. They eventually met the w the wife, met the the uh, mistress, and it was all very bizarre, kind of like a Peyton Place type. Uh, 
uh, drama, you know, a soap opera drama. But um, over time, over a number of years, as this relationship continued, uh, Betty, my mom, she got pregnant with me. And so when she told, she told her, her uh, paramour, you know, her, her lover, Joe, he was a nice guy, he was a hardworking guy, he had his own family, his family was doing very well, he provided for everybody, he was providing for her financially, because you know, she was, my mom was struggling, raising her daughter. Um, Betty told him, Joe, I'm, I'm pregnant. Well, to make a long story short, he told her, listen, I don't want a child. We're not gonna live with this, you know, you put the child up for adoption. And that was the thing back then. We're going back into the early 1950s. This was the way society went back then. This was the custom. You, you, you have a child out of wedlock. It's a shameful thing by society standards and the family standards. And so she had the burden of, of trying to figure out what to do with me. Uh, come to find out, she had a lot of heated arguments with Joe while I was still in her womb. She had a lot of heated arguments with Joe because, you know, he would not budge. He was stubborn and said, uh, uh, no, we're not having a child. You know, you get rid of this child and you put him up for adoption because that was a common thing back then. So she found out that, first of all, that through an, uh, an intermediary, a couple that knew her in her neighborhood, they told her, listen, we happen to know of a Jewish family in the Bronx, a couple in the Bronx, who are looking for a child. They, they were in their 40s at the time, my, my adoptive parents, and she, my birth mother was also uh, about 40 years old. When I was born, she was about 42, if I remember correctly, which is a little unusual to have a child that late in life. But anyway, she, they somehow hooked up to an intermediary. She didn't really meet them, but they kind of just, through the intermediary, uh, just a, a caring woman who tried to iron, be like a matchmaker, she um, worked things out. And so the agreement was that when, when Betty was getting ready to give birth to me, she would go to the hospital and I would be born. And then, she, of course, she would have to leave. And then at a later time, a few days later, a week later, whatever, it was prearranged, the other couple, my adoptive parents would, would pick me up. And that's what happened. But, but prior to that, uh, prior to that, uh, Betty and Joe, as I was, the story was told to me later, uh, had a lot of battles over me while I was still in my mother's room. And in 1978, uh, after I was arrested, my uh, mother gave a story to a reporter which came out in good housekeeping. It was a lengthy story and it was, the story was titled, First Time Ever, The Startling Story of Son of Sam's Real Mother. And it's my mother, Betty Falco's story. And that was, she still carried her, her married name, even though Tony was long gone, and she had a, a maiden name, a Broder, you know. Uh, but uh, she told the story of how um, she and, and Joe used to argue and fight, and one day she got so angry, she, she jumped on, on Joe's back, I was, I was punching him. Now I want this child, I wanna keep this child, I wanna keep this child, and there was tension. And, and the point I'm, I'm getting at uh, is that uh, I, years later, uh, I learned that um, through this couple, through this book that was given to me uh, called God's Power to Change by uh, John Loren and Paula Sanford, some friends just got me this book out of the blue, I wasn't familiar with these people, but they deal with um, like, kind of like deliverances and, and people that are oppressed with, you know, uh, by, by um, a dark spirits. And people go through struggles, depression. They get, be they get behind the, the nuts and bolts of, of why these things happen. And they're in a chapter called Death Wishes, I don't have time to read everything, in a chapter called Death Wishes, it, it they, they, uh, people have discovered that even when a child is in the womb, the child can sense certain things that are going on, loud noises, it can sense rejection, it can sense emotional trauma, that the child is not just growing in there passively, but is, is aware of the surroundings, or could be aware of agitate, agitating surroundings or happy surroundings, peace and serenity or, or noise and conflict, and this affects the child's development 
even in the womb. There's these scientific, there's scientific studies that have proven this, that you know, life doesn't just begin when the child leaves its mother's womb, but even in the, in the stages of development, you know, and that maybe in the second half of the pregnancy, the, the child developing in the womb becomes more aware. But if a person goes through, if a child goes through a lot of trauma, even while it's in the womb, it has an effect on, on the individual. And uh, one of the things it's, um, let me just let's read this. I think people would find this absolutely fascinating. I just want to read a few portions from the book. It says, in homes where children are longed for and love, reception begins to heal first frights and nauseas, even in the womb. When traumas surround and invade the womb, fighting, bickering, loud noises, and hurtful emotions, the spirit of the child cannot overcome the nausea of general defilement. We all suffer by being in, in this second world. And then it talks about a child that you're know, dealing with rejection, grows up with death wishes, have, always does self-sabotaging behaviors and things like that. So I believe, and, and this is not an excuse for anything that happened, but I believe that even when I was in the womb, I began to experience trauma that affected me later in life. Now, as I was uh, taken home by the Berkowitzes, and these were beautiful, loving parents, you couldn't ask for better, better parents than the Berkowitzes. Uh, when I was about four or five, and I lived in the Bronx on, on Stratford Avenue in the Soundview section, that's where I grew up, uh, I don't know what the reason why, but I remember being in the living room and my parents wanted to talk to me about something serious. So I remember I was kind of nervous and I was sitting there, I was about four or five years old at the time, and that's when my dad told me and my mom was looking, sitting on the sofa looking on and my dad was standing up about uh, five or six feet away from me and I was sitting on a chair or whatever and my dad says, we want you to know that David, you were adopted. And I thought to myself, okay, and I didn't really, I'm, I don't really know what that is. And, and they explained that uh, when you were born, your mom died while giving, giving birth to you. And that your dad, realizing he couldn't take care of you, put you up for adoption. And so when we found out that you were available for adoption, we made the arrangements to adopt you and we brought you home to us. I remember feeling very numb and, and very shocked because I'm trying to process all this. And again, I was just a little child. And I had a lot of questions. I asked about my dad, who's my dad? Where's my dad? And who was my mother? And they said, they were very nice and sweet and soft-spoken. I remember the serious looks on their faces. And they said, David, we, we don't know. We just know that your, your mother died while giving birth to you. And that, you know, we took you in because we love you and we wanted a son and you're our son and we're glad to have you here. And while I received all that, a, a part of me as a child thought, my mom died while giving birth? I'm saying, what did I do wrong? Did I do something that I made? I mean, I don't understand, I didn't understand what, how childbirth really worked, except that a woman carried a, a child in the womb and then eventually the child came out because I'm only like four or five. And I'm thinking, my mom died? I must have killed her. What did I do wrong? Did I maybe, I asked like, did I hurt her? Did I hurt my mom? Did I kick her? Did I come out wrong? Did, it, something, did I scratch her? Did I poke her? You know, what happened? He said, no, 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 this, these things happen. These things happen. It, it's just a tragedy, don't, you know? But I was like, I remember thinking, oh, this can't be, I, I don't understand. I hurt my mother, I don't even know who she was. I, I mean, I had no choice about the matter, but so over the years, I lived with the thought that somehow, some way, because my mother died while giving birth to me, that I was responsible for her death. I couldn't fully comprehend these things at the time, but this is where I was at, you know, mentally and emotionally. And I grew up thinking, oh my goodness, my mom died because of me, I'm a bad boy. Look at me, I killed my mother, I did something wrong. And then, um, when he said, my parents told me, you know, your, your dad didn't want me, I felt like, 
oh, there's, there's, my dad is out there. There's a, there's a father somewhere who, who's maybe thinking about me. Maybe he, he wishes he changed his mind. He really wants me to come to him. Or maybe he's angry at me and he hates me because he's, you, you killed my wife. You know, how did you do that? You stupid kid, I'm going to get you. And I'm, I'm thinking, he might hunt me down and try. You remember, I'm just five, six, seven years old growing up. Well, to make a long story short, this started a period of, of really bad behavior problems for me. First of all, I was born, I, I, I didn't know till I was already in prison and much later in life, I was born with ADD, you know, attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity disorder. I was a wild, energetic, out of control kid, throwing my toys around, running up and down the room, and um, growing up, at my, I was a, a, a thorn in the flesh to my parents. I drove them crazy. I'd be up at five o'clock in the morning, come out of bed, go to my toy box, pull out all my toys, wake up my parents, what are you doing up so early? And I, I just couldn't sleep. I was always running around. And, and that was the story of my life. And uh, in school, I, because that ADD was not really recognized at, at the time, it was just seen as a behavioral disorder. Uh, I was constantly being, uh, constantly getting in trouble in school. I was a terrible student, disruptive, loud, running up and down. I had so much energy that when school ended every day at three o'clock, when I was in public school 77 in the Bronx, that's not, the school is still there, but it goes by a different name now. When I, I would take my books and run home about five blocks to my house, run as fast as I could, I had so much energy. In fact, one day I even got hit by a car running across the intersection of Westchester Manor Avenue because the light changed and I was so busy running that the car hit me and it bumped me and it flew up in the air. It turned out I was okay. But I mean, my ADD got me into so much trouble and made school a living hell. I hated school. It seemed like some of the teachers hated me. I was a disciplinary problem. Uh, one of the teachers wanted to leave me back and my mother, had, when I was in third grade, my mother had to go to school and plead with, with the school officials to give me another chance and they, they overruled the teacher and they allowed me to go to the fourth grade on a trial basis, and I somehow struggled with the help of my parents, my adoptive parents, to finish public school, then go on into junior high school, where my mom, my adoptive mother, will die not too long after that from cancer. I remember all the struggles I had, not only in school, but my behaviors, but the things I did, the, the wild tantrums I had when I was a kid, it was like a force would come in me and I would, I would throw myself on the floor and, and, and have like these wild fits and break up furniture. I broke all my toys. Every time I got a new toy, within a few weeks it was broken. Everything I did had a self-destructive, death wish type uh, behavior pattern to it. And of course, no one could ever understand why. School officials, when I was in public school, they told my parents, listen, you got a problem child here. I don't know what their exact words were, but they met with them in private and said, listen, you have to take your child to a child psychologist. If you want your child to finish school and stay in this public school, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Berkowitz, you have to get, try to get them help. So they made arrangements for me to see a child psychologist. And for two years, every Saturday afternoon, I hated it, on my day off from school, my mom had to take me to Manhattan to talk to a child psychologist by the name of Mrs. Sosnoff. Well, an elderly lady who was a nice lady, but of course she's no longer alive. And I remember going there, the sessions lasted about an hour every Saturday during school, school year. And uh, to try to iron out, you know, what was causing me all the problems. And of course, nothing was ever accomplished, nothing was ever done. But it satisfied the school officials that, okay, they're making an effort. And in, and in the end, eventually I managed to finish public school, sixth grade, went into seventh grade in junior high school and, and on to high school. And it really was my dad. I had so many learning disabilities because I couldn't focus or concentrate in school. I just couldn't, I, you know, I managed to hang in there, but I mean, I was truant a lot because I couldn't stand sitting in that classroom. And when I was in high school, I was truant a lot because by that time my mom had, my adoptive mother had died and my dad was at work all the time, so I was a lock, lock, uh, latchkey kid. I had my own keys, and you know, I was 13, 14, managing on my own. And uh, anyway, it was, it was a struggle. And I look back, it says, all the times I had 
periods of tremendous depression, all the times I would think of, of killing myself, and there were times I would look out the window, we lived on the sixth floor, and from my window I could see for miles and miles, it was really a great place to live in this part of the Bronx. And um, I could never understand why I was so like that. It wasn't until years later where I finally understood, you know, that's it. I mean, it was like a time of enlightenment, which just a light went off, and I began to, as I grew older and reflected on things, I lived with false guilt. I was punishing myself with all my self behavior patterns, my self-destructive and self-sabotaging behavior patterns were because I thought that I, I had somehow done something wrong and caused my mother to die while giving birth to me. So I grew up with this tremendous self, sense of guilt that the woman who brought me into the world somehow I caused her to, to die. Because that's a tremendous traumatic thing for a child to be told at age of four or five, hey, your mom died while giving birth to you. Now my parents later on, I spoke to my dad about it and we, we talked and we, you know, I'm just kind of going through things very quickly now, but we talked about it and you know, my, my parents, my adoptive parents meant well. That's what the experts told them to say to a child. You know, adoption was common back then when kids are born out of wedlock, and when you're ever going to talk to your child about adoption, they're going to obviously have questions. The standard answer was, your mom died while giving birth. They never, these so-called experts never thought of the guilt that they would lay up on an individual by telling them something like that. And I had no conception of what was going on, so little did I know, everything, all the reckless things, I was so accident prone. I mean, I tripped over everything. I crashed into everything. I fell down steps. I, round, I rode my bike off the curb. I did all kinds of stuff. And, you know, it never dawned on me, this, this was like a suicide wish. This was a death wish in action. My life was one big death wish. And, uh, I mean, I had many good times growing up, and a lot of times, you know, with friends and everything, but there was always that demon of, 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 of guilt hanging over me, crushing my spirit, oppressing me, causing me to do things that I'd always get in trouble. Just when I started to do good in school, I'd find some reason to mess up. Just when I was behaving, I'd get into a fight with uh, another kid in the block. Anything to mess myself up. And I wasn't doing this consciously, but it was a, a, I, I, a sense of I have to punish myself. I didn't consciously think that, but this was going on in my subconscious that I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. This is, my life is, you know, I just always put myself in predicaments where, and this was like to assuage my guilt, which I didn't even know I had, but that was a part of my life. That was such a big part of my life. And so anyway, that was, I believe, you know, that spiritually speaking, that this type of, the things that I experienced, the uh, rejection and the, um, uh, confusion and the misinformation opened the door to, to uh, the entry of like demonic control in my life because as a child I, I did a lot of weird things. I craved the darkness. I used to crawl under my bed sometimes for hours hiding in the dark. I used to tunnel my way into the closet, one of the uh, clothing closets and just hide there. My mom used to think I was outside playing and I'd be just in the dark and I, you know, all my suicidal thoughts, all my wishes to die thinking about death. Now I understand that this was probably all clustered around that. Well, years later, uh, after I got out of the army, I did, um, I found out that there was an organization uh, called ALMA, Adoptees Liberty Movement Association. And uh, anyway, they help people to try to, lo that have been adopted, to try to locate their parents or their families and, and vice versa they help those who put children up for adoption and years later want to find out how those kids are doing they also so it was a, it was a it was a very interesting group and i went to some of their meetings and i remember going there the first time we met in manhattan and i just have to go through this quickly i wish i could explain it in more detail but there's time limitations nevertheless i i joined this group and i was got out of the, after I got out of the army because I was searching for my roots. By this time, my dad had moved to Florida and although I had, although I had aunts and uncles in, in other places out in Long Island, I, 
I never saw them very much, so I was pretty much on my own. And um, working as a security guard and, and just trying to make ends meet, going to, going to college on the GI, on the, the GI Bill, because I was an Army veteran at this time, having finished three years in the Army and being honorably discharged. Uh, anyway, um, I started to look up at the, at the advice of these people uh, how to find my original birth certificate, which was sealed by the court. And they found out a way to get to do that. And when I came, ac I came across in records in, in Manhattan, in, in New York City, the Office of Bureau of, of Births and Deaths, this big, big building, uh, I went through there searching, searching, searching like a detective, and finally I found the name David Richard Falco. And when I looked at that name, and I was about maybe 22 at the time, 21, I said, wait a minute, that's not a Jewish name, David Richard Falco. I mean, it should be Richard David Falco, Richard David Falco. I said, that's not a Jewish name. So I, I told my dad about it. I called my dad in Florida. I said, Dad, listen, I explained what happened. I said, I want to know the truth. What am I doing with the name Richard David Falco that's not a Jewish name? Who am I? And my dad, we were very nice. My dad and I had a good relationship. He told me, he says, David, here's what happened. You were born out of wedlock, and you know, that was hidden at the time, and, 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 he, and he, he, he sent me the original birth certificate. He kept it in a safe deposit box all those years. So he sent me the original birth certificate, and when I saw the name Falco, I was able to begin my search to, when I found out my mother was alive. See, originally I, I was gonna think about maybe trying to find my dad, but I didn't, because I didn't think my mother was alive. Then I found out, she never died after all. That was just, a, that was a lie. You know, they meant well, but that was a lie. And so anyway, I, I found her, and uh, it's a long story how that happened, and we had a beautiful, beautiful meeting. Uh, unfortunately, the media uh, turned that around to make it, and people in the media have said, oh, it was a terrible reunion. We didn't get along. Nothing could be further than the truth. We had a love for one another. This was the my mom, Betty, I'm talking about my birth mother, uh, you know, having met her for the first time when I was about you know, 21, 22, and finding out I had a half-sister too named Rosalind, I says, I got, and she had nieces and, and uh, 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 her husband, and I suddenly had a family. It was, this was the most beautiful thing. These were the sweetest people. My mom was the sweetest lady. She was so apologetic. She said, listen, you know, I was just struggling. And I said, hey, that's okay. She told me the whole story. This is how I know about Joe and the struggles she had, you know, carrying me and things like that. But I turned out, you know, everything turned out to be okay. The crimes that happened later had nothing whatsoever to do with her. This was just psychologists and college professors and all these so-called experts putting their opinions into things and making things seem like this way when they really were not. Unfortunately, I was going through many struggles. Um, I got into some, some, I was lonely, looking for friends, peers. I got into Satanism. And I always had struggles with depressions and things, so I was very open and vulnerable. And in, my, um, in the story that my mother uh, gave in 1978, this is my birth mother. I know it gets a little confusing. Um, it, shows, it shows something that I, I never saw in myself before, and that was how I was breaking down mentally. This was at the time now of the crimes. This is when the crimes had started and things were going on. I, I believe that I was not only oppressed by the devil, so to speak, but also had very serious you know, mental health issues. And because um, now this is going back in, in 1977, 76, 77. Uh, this is just from the article, I'll just read a little bit. Shortly after they became acquainted, uh, that's me and my sister and, and mother, you know, my birth family, I found my birth family, Nat Berkowitz called Rosalind, Rosalind was my half sister, a very beautiful, loving woman, and he said, he, oh, the article said, he, he felt strongly that David needed psychiatric help. He had seen David standing in front of a mirror, pounding his head, his, his head with his hands. He begged Rosalind to see if she could get her brother to go for help. And you're talking about me. Rosalind tried, but was unable to convince David to get therapy. So she offered to go with him. 
if that would make it easier. But his response was always the same. I tried it and they can't help me. I don't like talking to them. Soon after that, Nat Berkowitz called her again with an even more urgent problem. He was upset because David had just called and told him that he was going to the doctor, that he was going to die. There was something wrong with his head. So here's my adoptive father in desperation reaching out to my half-sister, whom he never met. They just spoke over the phone. He reached out to her because he was so alarmed at my behavior. And this is going back, you know, 40 years. Uh, when I was about 20, by this time 23, uh, 23 years old. And uh, the article went on to say, Rosalind was stunned. She had heard nothing about this from, from Richard. That's me, they, they called me Richard. She called Richard immediately and asked, what is this about your head? Richard, that's me. Yeah, yeah, I, I probably have a tumor or something. I don't have too long to live. I'm, I'm going to go to the doctor. Rosalind asked if there was any way she could help. No, no, he assured her, that's me, and there was no further discussion. See, my birth family called me Richard because they knew me as Richard David Falco, but my adoptive family called me David. And, you know, so that's why it's a little confusing, the, the changing of the names. And then it goes on to say, then there was the phone conversation Rosalind had with Richard when he really seemed out of it. She, my sister was saying, He's, you know, I seem so out of it. He was sort of giggling. I asked him what was the matter. He said, oh, nothing. They're out to get me, but they're not going to get me. I said, who is out to get you? He said, people, just people. I think my phone is bugged. I even think they bugged my car. They're out to get me. They're going to get me. Again, I asked who, what makes you say this? Just people, just people. And he said, that's me talking, that I have to go now. Rosson assumed that I was, it was just high on something. And, and then the article goes on and on, but it shows me but something that I couldn't even see myself, how irrational I had become, how really schizophrenic and depressive, and really my life was spiraling out of control, mentally, spiritually. Uh, I believe, uh, and the reasons for this, I was under increasing degrees of demonic control because at the time I was reading the Satanic Bible, I, was, uh, I went to a park uh, near where I lived in Yonkers. I went uh, against wisdom to move to Yonkers in the first place to be near this park called Untermeyer Park where I had some friends there that were into ritual, ritual occultic stuff. The park, it's a long story, but that park was, was dedicated to, to, occult, uh, to occult things. Uh, the owner of the park was once a member of the Golden Dawn. He was uh, the man who once owned the park before it became a city park. And it was his personal property. It was a huge, beautiful place with, with all kinds of statues and all kinds of things, you know, dedicated to occult, occultic stuff. Um, Untermeyer Park uh, was owned by Samuel Untermeyer, who was also rubbed shoulders with Aleister Crowley, who, Aleister Crowley was one of the most evil men who ever lived, the father of Satanism, and all on and on. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, my life was really coming apart. I was, my personality was disintegrating. I began to get, be controlled by other entities that I opened myself up for. But I had a propensity for that all my life because of the experiences I had in childhood, the trauma and everything. It did open up the door to demonic strongholds being set up in my life. And so anyway, um, the, the crimes happened, there was a tragedy, I was uh, arrested, and I was so uh, glad to finally be arrested because I was in such a state of torment. My life was truly a mess. I was, even, I was able to work and function outwardly, but inwardly uh, I was just in turmoil. And I, I was not, I believe, in my right mind. Um, when I was arrested, uh, you know, the police asked me, oh, you're son of Sam? I said, well, yes. And I was very respectful to them. You know, interestingly how the story changes over time and you see all these embellishments that come in. Uh, one of the things that keep getting said over and over again is whenever this thing is repeated, which is a lot, often when I was first arrested, you know, the police asked me, you know, are you uh, son of Sam? And I, I said, you know, yes. And I was, you know, very cooperative and respectful to them. But, but I never said, so what took you so long? And over and over again, you read articles and all these 
professors and all these people always say the same, oh, Berkowitz said, well, so what took you so long? As if I were teasing them. But uh, if I would had done that, uh, they would have uh, beat me up pretty good because I would have been just, you know, you can't mouth off to an officer like a wise guy. And they would have slapped me around. The fact that everything went so you know, peacefully showed that I, ne I never said that. I, in fact, I asked a, a friend, again, Maury Terry, a, a journalist who had been following the case from the very beginning. I said, Maury, could you please check to see from early reports that are in the papers or in the media if I actually said so what took you so long? He checked and got back to me a few weeks later and says, no, that's not recorded anywhere. That's just an embellishment that happened. And it, 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 it may sound like a minor thing, like, so what's the big deal of that one sentence? But it changes the whole, the whole picture. Um, it made me look like some kind of smart, smart aleck or something like that. Another misconception that has come is the, is the so-called Mona Lisa smile. Because uh, there were you know, pictures of me taken by the media and I had like a smirk on my face. So why does he have the smirk? And it, it, it's, the reason was because I was, uh, I was embarrassed and I was afraid. I mean, I was, I was arrested and it was, it was a nightmare, you know, uh, getting fingerprinted, getting booked, going to police headquarters where I was grilled by detectives for hours and hours. It seemed like the whole day. When they took me out of the precinct in, in, in Brooklyn and they brought me before the public, they did this thing called the perp walk where they were, you know, they walk you through the streets. They purposely walked you around the block so everybody could look at your face. That was, that's it's still being done today, and there's a lot of issues with that. But nevertheless, they took me on the so-called perp walk, but the detectives, by this time, there was nothing but hysteria in the city. It was a time of bedlam. And the detectives told me, listen, we're gonna, we gotta walk you, we gotta walk you around, we're gonna take you into another van to take you to police headquarters. I was in Brooklyn at the time. So they took, they said, listen, the place is mobbed with people, you stay with us, we, we, we think someone's going to try to maybe shoot you or something like that. If we push you to the ground, don't resist, just fall to the ground. Now, I'm, I'm terrified because I, I don't know what's happening. I've never experienced anything like this before. I've already been up for hours without sleep, without anything to eat. So they take me out of the building and into this mob of nothing but flash bulbs. I'd never seen so many people, mostly media people, crowding around, it seemed like by the hundreds, if I remember correctly. My mind was in a fog, but I still remember. And they, they were marching me around the block, and I felt they was just snapping pictures like crazy and yelling at me, and people were screaming in the background. Reporters, 20 at a time, were asking me questions. And I'm like, I felt so embarrassed. And plus, I was so scared that one of the things, especially men do when they're embarrassed by something, they, they, they kind of like smile, like, you know, you do something dumb and, and some people would react, oh man, I'm so sorry. Other times it would be like, oh man, I messed up. So in, it was just a natural reaction to, to have like a smirk on my face. But it wasn't, but the media and, you know, other people have took that the wrong way. To this very day, because they made it look like I'm laughing at people, but I wasn't. I was really just so overwhelmed with everything that happened, so embarrassed, so confused, and I was afraid that I, you know, I just, when you're afraid, sometimes you, you smile, say, okay, you know, whatever, and, and that picture has stuck with me all, all these years, but it was just another misconception. Not that it means anything, but it just shows you how easy it is to, to look at something and get the wrong impression. And all these talking head experts for, till this very day comment on this, say, oh, this, oh, that. And you know what? It was, it was really about nothing. But it, it just, that's the way it, 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 it ended, you know? So anyway, you know, here I am today, all these years later, uh, 10 years into my prison sentence, giving my life to Jesus Christ, and my life has never been the same since. Uh, the Lord, God has been with me. Uh, I grew up in the Bronx. It was, a, it was a great place to grow up. Even though I had a lot of, hood, a lot of childhood, childhood depression and traumas and bad experiences in school. Uh, I was a rough, rough kid in the neighborhood, always fighting. But I had friends. I, I did good. I managed. I had a loving family, my adoptive parents always stuck with me and you know um, 
I, I survived, I survived. I, I think the Bronx was the greatest place to live because uh, from my window, I could see for miles. I lived on the sixth floor and I could see for miles. And sometimes I could stick my head out the window and look down the street on Stratford Avenue where I lived and I could see across the Long Island Sound, which is a, a, a big body of water separating the Bronx from, from Queens. And at night, I used to be able to see the lights from Shea Stadium where the New York Mets played. The lights would, when they had a home game, the lights would go up into the sky. And I remember always looking at that. I was like a real baseball fan growing up with the Yankees and the Mets and things like that. I had it like in many ways a normal childhood. So uh, I have a lot of good memories. I rode my bike everywhere uh, for miles and miles. Uh, my bike helped me to keep my sanity and work off all that the hyperactive, I'd be, I'd be pedaling my bike from morning till night. So uh, my life was had its ups and downs, bittersweet adventures and things like that, and tragedy too, you know, you know. You know, one other misconception is, of course, the big story about the dog, uh, the, the talking dog. First of all, as I shared in uh, the article, that my mother gave to the Good Housekeeping back in 1978, where my sister also spoke. Uh, and I had a lot of you know, mental health issues. I really was losing my mind. I had become schizophrenic. And uh, I believe that was a result of the, of the demons that were really in, uh, inside of me and working and that I opened myself up to. But I had mental health issues all my life and behavioral issues all my life, including the uh, attention deficit disorder and the hyperactivity, which back then as a child, you know, wasn't even recognized. You were just, I was just seen as a nuisance and a, and a disciplinary problem and somebody for teachers to scream at because of things which I couldn't control. I'm, I'm sorry, I just couldn't control that stuff. But nevertheless, my mental health began to deteriorate. And at times I was hallucinating and I did, during some occultic rituals, use LSD as well as drink some wine. So I had some maybe after effects of that, and I used LSD when I was in the army too. Not to make excuses, but this was at the time some of the things I was dealing with as, as a young man, you know, just trying to make it in life and, and just trying to survive and just doing things that young men usually do sometimes without thinking, you know. Um, it, because, because of, the, of, 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 the, of the Satanism, one of the deities that I used to pay homage to was a deity by the name of Samhain, Samhain which I used to call Sam Hain, spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N, Sam Hain. He was a Druid, Druidic deity of Druids, which demanded human sacrifice. And because I used to seek communication with this this demonic entity, as, as, as dumb and crazy as it sounds, I, you know, this, I, I regret this, this was a nightmare, but at the time, that's what I was doing. So I was calling upon this demonic entity, this druid spirit, and it, it was like he was reaching out to me. In my mind, I was really, felt I was really getting messages from him. I was reading literature uh, from a, a church called the, the, Pro, the Process Church of Final Judgment. I was using some of that literature which was calling on uh, to start anarchy and, and, and try to bring in the end of the world so, so that Jesus could come back. It was, it was a whole mixed up, twisted philosophy, but it, it was something that was, I believe, demonically energized. The teachings which I was reading from, also the satanic, the satanic Bible, and other things I was trying to do uh, at that time of my life of searching and everything, these things became very real. It was hard to distinguish reality from, from, from that. And you know, still struggling to make a living and work and pay bills, and I, even though I was getting further and further behind. When I was arrested, I only had $65 to my name, so I was on a collision course with death. Um, also, uh, oh, well, concerning the, the so-called dog, um, after I, I came to, to prison, because that became a big thing, you know, they said the, the media and everything went wild, or the dog made him do it, Harvey the dog, which was a neighbor's dog named Harvey, it had nothing to do with the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the crimes. It had nothing to do with the crimes. But the media 
somehow I, you know, I don't know, they made it, made it like the, that dog was talking to me, this or that. It was a time of a lot of confusion, but I was trying to let people know in a roundabout way, a way it was my fault too. But I was trying to let people know, no, the, Sam, Sam, the dog's name was not Sam, it was named Harvey. Sam Hain Sawin was the deity that was communicating with me. And people could never make that distinction because they had no understanding of spiritual things. And I couldn't explain it clearly myself. My mind was a mess. So that's how that whole thing started. And when I got to prison, uh, you know, when, you, when you're a new person in prison, especially when you have a high profile case like I did, you know, a lot of the guards, a lot of the inmates would tease you. You know, you have that time, kind of thing, initiation phase where you're a new jack coming into prison. I came to prison uh, with multiple life sentences. I went to Attica Prison, one of the most dangerous and infamous prisons in the United States, because uh, about seven or eight years earlier, they had a major riot where over 40 people were killed, and, and so it, it had a terrible reputation, and, and it was a, a, a difficult atmosphere. And so I took a lot of ribbing from people about the dog. Sometimes guys would make barking noises. Some of the guards even, just teasing me, would make barking noises, go, oh, and you know, it's stupid childish stuff, but that's you know how it is in, in that kind of life. And it, but it used to bother me so much, and I got into a few fights over that. And uh, one day I just I said, thinking that, I, it was kind of like a magical thinking, I think that I was thinking that if I just said, oh, there, there was no real talking dog or anything like that, that it, all the, everything would just go away. So I, I, I said that to somebody, I wrote that to somebody in the media, and. Um, it made it look like the whole story was made up. But it, it wasn't, I can't, I, it wasn't really made up. I mean, I, there was an actual demon by the name of Sam Hain that, that I was communicating with. I regret to say that sounds very dumb, but at the time I really believed that stuff, you know, and I was really brainwashed and, and I believe I was under a degree of hypnotic control. This is not to make an excuse for anything, but at the time of my life, that's how messed up I was. I still, even in my, even when I was in Attica, I still had some occult books and I was practicing rituals in myself. Very dumb and foolish things, but that's what I was doing uh, in my ignorance and in my rebellion and just trying to survive. I only wanted to survive. So I figured that by saying, oh, there was no dog, I just made the whole thing up, the whole thing would go away. But really, it was confusion to begin with because there really wasn't a, a dog, it was a demon. But no one was able to make that distinction. And so for years, and even till today, there's been a lot of misconceptions about that. And that'll probably always be there because it's too complicated to figure out. People listen to it and, oh yeah, sure, I just, you know. But that's the way it was. It was just a, um, a lot of confusion, yeah. So the dog barking wasn't, had nothing to do with anything. Well, it was annoying at times, because it was, but it was annoying at times, but it, you know, it, it wore me down, but the barking dog wore me down, and at times it was annoying, and, uh, but that, that... I'm sorry, so tell us that, so it was your neighbor that had a barking dog? Well, there was a number of them. This is, this has been a, a thing even going back to the Bronx, but it, that, the, 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 the barking dog had nothing to do with the crimes. That was just a... Once I got into that media cycle of whatever, it just got built up to some dramatic thing when really it was just a... The two stories got mixed together. Yeah, right, right. My communication w with demons back and forth, which uh, I was under a spell. And uh, again, that's not to make any excuse for anything, but that's the way the state of my mind was at the time. And then the actual barking of neighbor's dogs, which was annoying, but that was something altogether different. And it just melded together in one ball of confusion. And it's been that way ever since, a ball of confusion. And people don't know what to make of it, but you know, it, it's not a big issue anymore. I mean, it's just nothing. Really, it's about nothing. But I don't know, for some reason, people become obsessed. They lock into that dog thing. And then and movies have been made about it, and all kinds of books, novels, crime novels have that. And all. So that's just part of the history. That's be there forever, but the reality is that had nothing to do with the crimes, that I was communicating, I'm sorry to say, with, with demonic entities and my ignorance and my foolishness, and I was getting messages, I thought I was getting messages in my mind, you know, from, from these entities and so forth, and so that was the real deal, and that's, you know. Well, I had, you know, even as a 
a child, as you know, I've always been fascinated with like dark things. And uh, I believe that because uh, of the experiences I had, the traumas I went through as a child, thinking I caused the death of my mother, uh, thinking that I have a, a father out there who hated me because I, I took his wife's life somehow, did something dumb, and on, on and on, and self-punishment and all these cravings for darkness and, and um, you know, that, that followed me all my, all my life. Even as an adult, I was, uh, as, as a teenager, and then even as an adult, I was fascinated by certain horror movies, Rosemary's Baby, and, and other things, all seemed to, I was always drawn to those things. And it was, um, you know, coming to prison, it was the same thing, I still had my occult literature, and it was just really a lost, lo lost lonely soul. And 10 years into my prison sentence, as I'm, I'm struggling you know, to survive day by day, along comes this fellow, uh, Ricky, Ricky, and a uh, younger man, and he approaches me one day while I'm walking in the prison yard. And he says, you know, hey, um, your name's Dave, right? And I said, yeah. He says, well, my name's Ricky, and I'd like to introduce myself. I said, yeah, so what's going on? I looked at him suspiciously, because in prison environment, guys that don't know each other usually don't just walk up to one another. It's just a, a way of life in the prison. And he said, uh, listen, I, I, know, I know about your case and everything, but uh, I, I, I would like to just tell you that Jesus Christ loves you, and he's got a plan of purpose for your life. And I said, yeah, I was like skeptical. I said, yeah, okay, I've, I've heard that before. But there's no way God could love me. I've done too many things that are bad, too many things that are evil. There's no way God could forgive me. He says, no, David, you're wrong. God wants to forgive you. And he's, he sent me here to tell you that. And he's got a plan and purpose for your life. Uh, and I'm thinking like, oh, really? And uh, he said, yeah. He said, well, listen, I see you sometimes work out with the weights and sometimes you walk around. I'd like to just be your friend and maybe we can hang out together. You know, I'm new here. And uh, he had been doing time prior, you know, in other prisons, but he was transferred here. So uh, he seemed like a nice guy, and before you knew it, we were hanging out together. And we'd walk the yard together, and he began to tell me as the days went by that he was a Christian, that he gave his life to Jesus while he was locked up in, in another facility. And uh, he would share a little of the scriptures with me, a little about, about his life, and we just, you know, palled around, walked around. And... Um, and then he gave me a pocket Bible and he told me, Dave, I know you're Jewish, so maybe you'd like to read the Psalms. It was a Gideon pocket testament which, which, which had the uh, Psalms in the back. So you had the New Testament and the Psalms. And he says, look, I know you're Jewish and I think you'd like to read the Psalms. And I, so uh, I started to read them and I started to read about King David and because I like to read. And I started to read about King David and I saw all the struggles King David went on with his life, the, pain, crying out to God, and I kind of started to relate to that, uh, because I'm going through so much pain and trauma, and, uh, and the story is so, my story is so involved, so complex, you could never tell it in one setting. It would take days, weeks, months to, to unravel the whole thing. Um, I'm reading the Psalms sometimes at night before I go to sleep, and I find I start to cry, uh, you know, and, and, my, and I don't know why, but then one day, after I'd known Ricky maybe a month, maybe a little longer, because uh, this was a long time ago now, this was over 25 years ago now, um, I was reading Psalm 34, and I read the scripture, verse six, where it says this poor man cried and heard him and saved him out of all his trouble. And suddenly, once again, it was around midnight, I was alone in my cell with my little reading lamp on, and I read that Psalm and I started to cry. And I, I I just shut off my light because I didn't want any of the other inmates in the gallery to see me crying. And now again, we're all in individual cells. And I had this tremendous, they got this tremendous urge to get down on my knees and to talk to God. And so I did, in the darkness of my cell, I got down on my knees on the concrete floor, the cold concrete floor. And I, like a little kid, I, I put my hands on the, on the bunk at the, the typical prison bunk bed. And I just began to pour my heart out to the Lord. And I was crying like a baby. But I was talking quietly because I didn't want anyone else to hear me. But I was pouring my heart out to the Lord. And I was telling, saying, God, Jesus, whoever you are, I'm so sorry for everything that happened. 
I, I hurt so many people, I hurt my family, and I, I brought so much pain to people, and on and on, I just poured my heart out to him, you know, crying as if I was crying for my mother when she died. And uh, maybe I was on my knees 20 minutes, a half hour, I don't know, and then I got up off my knees, and I felt like a tremendous load had lifted off me. And in, I just got on my bunk, on top of my bunk, and staring at the ceiling for a while, and I drifted off to sleep. Next morning, I woke up and went about my business, going out to breakfast, the doors open, and start the usual day in prison. And um, uh, a couple of days later, I, met, I meet my friend Rick in the, in the yard. And, because we live in different cell blocks, so we could only meet when we have yard time, recreation time in the yard, and we'd hang out and talk, and maybe lift weights and walk around. And so we were, that day we were sitting on a bench at the end of the yard. And we're just sitting there talking. And I says, hey, Ricky, guess what I did the other day? And he said, what'd you do? I said, well, remember how you've been telling me, you know, to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins and to come into my heart and things like that? He goes, yeah. I said, well, I did that. And he looked at me. He was like shocked. He goes, you what? And I was, I was surprised by his reaction. So I said, well, you know, you told me that uh, to that I should ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins, that I should put my trust in him and, and things like that. And I says, I did. And he says, are you serious? He was so excited. I, I, are you, are you tell on the level? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, what's the big deal? He says, oh man, he jumped up, and he, he jumped off the bench. He started to jump up and down like a kid, screaming, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I was so embarrassed. I said, Rich, what are you doing? What are you doing? He says, Dave, don't you understand? You know what this means? I said, what does it mean? He says, you've been born again. You've been born again. I said, I have? He says, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, and I, I didn't know what was going on. He was so excited. He said, listen, I know you don't understand it right now, but you, one day you'll understand all these things. He says, you got Jesus in your heart now, and you, you mark my words, your life is never going to be the same. So I says, oh, okay. But, you know, he was right. I mean, I couldn't, I started to read the Bible, I couldn't put it down. I started to go to the chapel, and the chaplain gave me a whole Bible, new, Old and New Testament. It was like a study Bible as a gift, brand new study Bible, and I just couldn't put the Bible down. I would read it every chance I got, whenever I'd come from my work assignment, whenever I had free time, and I was in my cell, I'd open up my Bible and read, and it really started a whole new life. I met other men in the chapel who you know, you were glad to see me and welcome me, and. Uh, I began to fellowship with other Christians who were fellow inmates like myself and uh, met the chaplain and spoke with him and prayed with him and um, the rest is history. More than uh, about 27, 28 years have gone by since I was on my knees that one night asking Jesus to forgive me and to come into my life. Not even sure what I was saying, you know, not even sure what would happen and uh, Ricky was right. Well, shortly after that, a few months after that, you know, Ricky and I used to go to the chapel together, but he transferred out. One day I went to the yard and I didn't see him. We were supposed to meet in the yard after our work assignments were done. He wasn't there. So I asked a couple of friends from his cell block, hey, you guys seen Ricky? He said, oh man, Ricky left the day before on a transfer. He's gone. I said, oh man, I couldn't believe it. Because he was almost finished with his time. He was only doing a 10 year sentence and only had a brief period of time left to do. So he went down to a medium security facility to finish up his last year or whatever. And I never saw him again. But his words have always rung true. I look back today, the, t the testimony of what God has done in my life has really gone to so many places throughout the world. I've met friends from all walks of life. Uh, my testimony has gone into many prisons and jails, giving, giving men and women uh, a, a, a hope, you know, that, that God forgives sins that he does redeem people, that even if you're in prison, God will not reject you, that he's come to seek and save those who were lost, and that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God's hands of mercy is stretched wide open. God says, come to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And I realized I went through life without any rest. I had no peace of mind. My life was a story of, again, you know, triumph and tragedy, pain and, and, and everything. And uh, even though I had a lot of adventures in life and a lot of, did a lot of good things, there was still a lot of bad. But I never had that peace. I was a restless soul. I was a lost and lonely soul. And uh, never felt like I really belonged anywhere. Never felt that I had a real family. And, and 
self-destructive behavior patterns and all that stuff that I carried from childhood was always, always self-sabotaging whatever I was doing. But finally, I began to have peace. I began to have joy. My life began to change for the better. And now I look back at all that happened. And oh, I tried my best in this interview in this brief period of time to explain everything. I realize it's just too big of a story and, and probably need to, you know, can't, can't really unravel everything. And the Lord says, David, forget about it. Don't even look back, you know. Just keep your hands to the plow, so to speak, and just go forward. He says, I have, I have made all things new in your life. And I'd just like to read a couple of scriptures that are so meaningful to me uh, over the years that have brought me so much encouragement. One of them is um, in Jeremiah chapter 29, um, uh, which verse, beginning at verse 11. Jeremiah 29, beginning at verse 11, which says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a, a expected end, to give you hope in an expected end. And uh, then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye search for me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. And even though he was talking to the Israelites specifically back then, I believe this promise is for every person that calls upon the name of the Lord, be they Jew or Gentile, whatever nation they come from, because the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so um, God brought me out of captivity. The same promise that he, he promised to the Israelites, he promises to every man and woman throughout the ages of time. Whoever puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, not only are they going to be, receive forgiveness of sins, but they're going to start a whole new life. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, He's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And truly the old things, even though I still have memories of them, in God's eyes, those old things have passed away. Another scripture that I love so much that has brought me so much comfort and it's so very special for me, also in the Old Testament, um, is in Micah chapter 7. It's a little, maybe a little known passage to some, but Micah chapter 7 verses 18 to 20, it's one of the most beautiful scriptures that uh, someone like me could ever, ever read. And it says as follows, Who is a God like unto thee that pardons iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He, that's the Lord, retains not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will turn again, he will have compassion on us, he will subdue our iniquities and will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. And thou will perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn to our fathers from days of old. And basically what that's saying is God is saying to, saying to me, he's saying to you, he's saying to everybody that, 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 that puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you're, 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 I delight in showing mercy so all your sins, all your iniquities, I'm throwing them into the sea, and they will never be remembered anymore. For someone like me, with such a, a, a bad background, that brings tremendous comfort, comfort and hope. Yeah, that brings tremendous comfort and hope. And I can go on and on. This is just a, just a few, uh, a small amount of scriptures that, that I have that, you know, people would just... I mean, they're so beautiful, they're so powerful, they're so, they're so full of hope and everything. And, um, and also, another one is Lamentations. This was written by the prophet Jeremiah. It's right after the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. It's Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. Some of the most beautiful verses, passage of scripture, a person can ever read. Uh, this I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good unto those that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait 
for the salvation of the Lord. And here we see the same thing that we read in Micah, that, that God is a God of compassion, because it said that in Micah chapter 7. And we read here also that he delights in mercy and that he's, uh, it's good, you know, he's, his compassions never fail. It's good for the soul. And, and God has been good to my soul. God has been good to my soul. So these are scriptures that I use over and over to comfort and encourage myself as well as others because I share my faith with other men in here. And uh, God has given me a whole new life. He's given me a whole new life. There's so much more I wish I could share, uh, but... Uh, what about that last one, uh, you know, the future? What's oh, the future of your hopes? Okay. You know, what's, what's the future about for us? Thank you. Okay, here's the... Okay, this is something. Uh, you, know, you know, one of the ways I spend my time is I do a lot of writing. I'm a prolific writer. I have a, a typewriter, but even with pen, I, I do a lot of writing. I have an online journal. I uh, write messages for churches, youth groups, things like that. So, and I've been doing that for years. And uh, earlier today, and I was thinking about this interview that I was going to do here, and I just put these words together on my typewriter and typed them up right after breakfast this morning, and it's called Going Back in Time. And it, it talks about, really, my, my future hope, desires, and dreams, and uh, I just want to, I'd just like to just read this, because I, I wrote this just this morning, uh, November 10th, 2015, 8.45 a.m. Going back in time. I wish I could go back to my childhood days. I wish I could begin my life all over again this time wiser and more aware of life and the complexities of life. Reflecting on things, my life has been too complicated. Much of what I experienced in life, even since childhood, has made me sad and weary, but it is all in the past, and now, by the grace of God, it is time to move forward. I know in my heart that good days are here now and better days are ahead because God is with me and all my sins and wrongdoings and failings are, as Christians often say, quote, under the blood of Jesus, end quote. Truly, my life is a tale of two cities, a life of pain, torment, guilt, and anguish, yet a life of triumph, hope, and forgiveness. For me, God has made all things go, all things new. For me, God has made all things new. As the populace scripture verse declares, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Psalm 30, verse 5. You know, uh, this is a new season in my life, you know, a time to go, to keep going forward by the grace of God, uh, to thank God for his mercy, to know that it really it's, it's by his mercy and grace that my life did not end prematurely. I could have died when uh, I did a lot of wild things as a kid, you know, jumping through subway cars and running up and down the streets. I was pretty wild, running through rooftops over rooftops, uh, doing things the kids, adventurous kids in the Bronx used to do. And I could have died when the police surrounded me with guns pointed at me from every direction. Uh, one move and they and they could have I could have been blown into eternity. I could have died when another inmate tried to slash my throat. Uh, back in 1979, just, just to make a name for himself. And that was one of my, the best prison experiences I ever had. And um, I, you know, I could have lost my life through sickness, disease, or whatever else, but the Lord kept me alive for a purpose. I got the chance to make peace with Nisa Moskowitz, and for a time we were corresponding, and she wanted to start a whole new thing on forgiveness and healing for the whole nation. It never worked out that way. But God saw the intentions of her heart. I believe he, he recognized that, you know. And uh, so I've had a, a lifetime of experiences, good and bad, horrific and sad, yet, yet some things joyous and, and wonderful. Uh, I'm very active in sharing my faith, uh, in writing spiritual things, and I want to continue to do that, reach this whole nation uh, with the news that Jesus Christ loves people, that he truly has a plan and purpose for their life. He wants them to give him all their sins and he will forgive them of those sins 
and cleanse them and give them a whole new life of redemption and hope. A life that will have a lot of difficulties and challenges because as a Christian, I experience a lot of struggles and day-to-day, -day, you know, testings of my faith and everything, which is normal, but God keeps me on course. And uh, I know my hope is that one day I see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. I'm gonna look into his eyes and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for saving a wretch like me. You know, and then my message has always been that if he could do it for someone like me, who was one of the chief of sinners, he can do it for anybody who just put their trust in him. From time to time, you know, because people ask about the situation with parole. When I was sentenced in three different counties, there was Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, in New York City, three different counties. Uh, I was given multiple life sentences by all the different judges. And one of the judges said to me that we're gonna give you a sentence that's gonna, hopefully, you're gonna take your last dying breath in prison. And at the time, I was just a lost soul. I didn't care, I, my life was a mess. I was really in a bad frame of mind. And, and uh, you know, so I went through that. It was all like a fog, and he ended up coming to prison. But as it turned out, the way the laws work, they were not really allowed to sentence me to consecutive sentences at the time because that was not as of yet on the books. So it, it, it consolidated by itself into one 25 year to life sentence. And which means that because it's one 25 year to life sentence, even though the judge, judges specified otherwise, the limitations of the law at the time made it consolidated everything. So in other words, if there were six life sentences, it became one, in, just on paper, just in a legal sense. So, but because of that, after 25 years, I went to the first parole board at 25 years, which is because it's 25 year to life sentence. And the parole board, of course, has authority to keep hitting you with more time, giving you more time, if they feel you're not eligible for release. Now, of course, in my case, because everything was so extreme and the case is so serious, you know, they will keep hitting me. And sometimes I went to the parole board and sometimes I didn't. But in a way, it would have made no difference. But I sent them, I written them letters, you know, apologizing and my letters were very remorseful. They took note of that. And they took note of the fact that I'm, I'm doing well in prison today and so forth. But because of the seriousness and nature of the crime, they keep giving me more time. And I have another pro board coming up, which is every two years as a matter of routine. But I feel that I didn't go to the last one, and I don't believe I, sh I should go to this one. Uh, I've accepted uh, my uh, sentence. I've come to terms with everything. And, you know, my fellow inmates, you know, meaning well, because they like me, they, they, the guys in here like me, I'm just one of the fellows, you know, and they try to encourage me, says, Dave, you need to go to the parole board. You, you, need, you need to give it a shot. You never know, you never know. I understand what they're saying, and they, and they mean well, and technically, uh, I could go. Not that it would make any difference, I could go. But I feel that um, I have to think of not myself, because sure, I would love to get out of prison. I, that would be my hope and dream. I have a lot of good... Plan, plans, if I would ever get out of prison, I would try to go all over churches, youth group, groups, sharing my testimony, uh, juvenile detention centers, trying to reach young people, on and on. If I had an opportunity to, um, to, to get out one day, that would be, of course, I'm thinking in my own mind, that would be a wonderful thing, because I have so many good plans, good, wonderful plans, uh, to touch this world for Christ and to give up messages of hope as well as give young people a cautionary tale. But all that aside, I have to look at you know, the victims of the crime and the fact that these people, wherever they are and whoever they are, I don't know, I'm not in contact with any of them and I'm not allowed to be, but I always have to think, how, would they, how do they see things? See, as a Christian, I'm taught you know, from the scriptures to put others first, to consider others better than yourselves and better than yourself and to think of yourself last, to think of others first in the world it's usually me, myself, and I, and others second. But see, Christ has taught me to, to, to value and respect other people even above myself. And, I'm, and I, as I think about this, I'm thinking, these, these, these people, are, some of them are still around. Some of the 
parents who've lost a loved one and oh, siblings and it's still around. And, and I know that such a thing would really upset them, would really just, it bothers, probably bothers them or agitates them. And I, I say, well, you know, I can't, I can't do anything to cause these people any more pain or heartache or grief. So let me just deal, accept the sentence, realize I, as much as I wish I could go back and change things, I cannot. I know that God has forgiven me, even if people have not. And, and now, by the grace of God, I'm moving on with my life. Parole is not even an issue anymore. I mean, it comes up in the media because there is a, always a scheduled hearing every two years, and that'll probably go on indefinitely. But I've already come, made peace with the whole matter. I said, you know what? My life is in God's hands. And I'm, by the grace of God, I'm doing a lot of good things, positive things today. You know, let me be thankful for that. And uh, I don't want to do anything that would cause any of the families or the uh, surviving victims who were injured any, any more pain, any more suffering. You know, let them live their lives as best as they could and let them have the satisfaction of knowing, you know, I'm not going anywhere, I'm not going to bother you, you know, that type of thing. I think that's the, the best way to do it. I think that's taking the higher road. Even though by rights I could try to get parole, I could go to the parole board every, every couple of years, whenever they have their hearings, I could come with all paperwork, I, letters of support, those things I have never done. I have never asked any Christian, anybody, or any church pastor or anything to, 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 uh, for letters of support or things like that. I don't believe in doing that. That's fine for other men that want to you know, do that, but I feel God is leading me to just, just let things be as much as possible, you know, and I, I feel that gives those people more peace, and that's what's important. It's not my feelings, it's not my wants, but their wants and desire. And if it gives them more peace to, to, to see me still locked up, then I want them to have that peace. If, if I could give them that much, I'll give them that much. I don't want them to have to, to worry, or be in agitation, have emotional pain and trauma, or wondering, oh, is he going to get out, and you know, this is, you know, like Jesus said to the storm, you know, peace, be still, relax, I'm not going anywhere. That's it. I feel that was the higher road, higher road to take. You know. Well, in prison, you know, because now I've been, as I said, in prison for 39 years, and I'll probably be in prison for many, many more years, probably maybe for the rest of my life, or unless Jesus comes and takes me out of here, um, I'm facing, you know, many more years of incarceration, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but one of the earlier experiences I had when I came to prison, I mentioned earlier about how guys used to tease me about the dog and things like that, and I tried to just end that by saying, oh, there, there was none of that. It was just a lot of misconceptions, but one day in 1979 is what often happens in prison, especially in the maximum security prisons, is inmate-to-inmate -inmate violence, which of course is a common thing. And so one inmate, for whatever reason, I guess to make a name for himself, uh, he fashioned a, a, a razor to some kind of stick or something and reached through the bars when I was doing my, my porter's work. I was like a custodian and I was mopping and cleaning and I got near his bars and he reached out and he slashed my throat. And it turns out he opened up the whole uh, side with the razor. The razor was buried to the hilt, practically, and opened up the whole side of uh, the left side of my uh, neck. And next thing you know, so I got this gaping hole in my neck, and I'm like, I'm on the gallery. I'm like, at this time, I was about, I think, about 26 years old, 25, 26 years old. I was a new jack. I'd only been in prison for maybe a couple of years at the most. So I, 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 was, I was like, okay. I, I, I didn't feel any pain, just a, a little sting. It was a very unusual experience. And I realized, oh man, this guy really cut me because I put my fingers there and my fingers went right inside, inside the neck. I know it sounds gross, but that's the, the whole side of my neck opened up. So I walk out to where the officers are sitting because they have their little control booth there where they look through the windows to watch down the galleries. And I'm standing there and says, listen, <laughs> I've been cut. And I actually had a smile, kind of like a smile on my face and says, hey, I guess somebody doesn't like me. And the officers look, oh my goodness. So they walk me across prison grounds to the 
uh, infirmary. I have to go to the infirmary now to be stitched up because I've got this massive wound. And the, the officer's like in a state of shock. So this one officer was Officer Montgomery. He walks alongside me, and we, we, go to, we go down the steps, down the steps outside into the other building to walk me through. And there's other inmates in the hallway who see me. You know, they know, they know me because they're working in the same building as me. And I say, oh, my God, Dave, what happened to you? I said, man, someone tried to take me out, you know. And a typical prison thing, you know. And I walked all the way to the infirmary. I didn't lose that much blood, amazingly. And I sat down in, in, on the table there, you know, the, the doctor, when the doctor examines you, and the doctor comes out and looks at me and says, oh man, and he's looking at the wound, he's got to stitch you up. I was fully conscious. I, as I said, I didn't lose much blood, even though the whole side of my neck was opened up. And he says, I can't believe they missed you. He missed your carotid artery. Because it was, he saw, I guess he could see all the veins in the main, that particular artery right there. He says, they missed your carotid artery. He said, I don't know how they did that. He said, man, you wouldn't even be, stand, be here right now if he hit you that way. And I'm like, I'm like joking with him. I'm like, well, you know, and he stitches me up. And then I, they put me in the infirmary because we have to keep you for about a week or so. I stayed about a week because they thought possibility of infection. It was a pretty gross and, and, and serious wound. But because I didn't lose any blood, you know, I was fine. They didn't have to take me to the outside hospital. They, that, that, the prison hospital in Attica is like a mass unit because guys come in every day with stab wounds, cuts, this, that. That's prison life. So I was just another one of the wounded, walking wounded, you know. And um, while I was in the hospital, you know, the, the state police and uh, whoever else, other law enforcement agencies, would come into the room I was in because they had to interrogate me to find out, you know, who did this. And, um, you know, back then I was young, but I, I knew about the prison code. And so I, I, they spent hours trying to get me to talk, and, you know, I, w I wouldn't tell them who did it, I, you know. And um, after about a week, they let me out. I was healing up, you know, they took the stitches out, and I went back to work just where, where I was before. But the interesting thing that happened was after, after that, when the inmates saw that I stood my ground and wouldn't squeal, quote unquote squeal, or rat on the guy that did it, they gave me, I, got, I earned a lot of respect. So word went out throughout the whole prison that Dave is a stand-up guy. And that, in other words, that was my test. It wasn't something I expected or wanted, but it turned out to be a test. And it, it proved something to the men that, you know, I can do my time and be a man. I know it sounds almost silly and, and petty, but that was the code back then. You, you lived and died by your reputation in prison, you know. If you had a bad reputation, you, you had a tough, tough way to go. And if you had a good reputation as a stand-up guy who wouldn't snitch on anybody and minded your business, you were cool. So I, I became, like to many of the guys, someone they could say, we could trust him. He's one of us, you know, he's not going to talk when under pressure. I know it sounds trivial and almost silly, but in, in the minds of the prisoners, my fellow prisoners and my peers, that was a big deal. So it put me up to a whole new level of trust and respect within the facility. And in the end, I could look back all these years later, even though it was literally a, a close brush with death because by this man just somehow missed that, that artery, um, I, uh, it, it turned out to my benefit. Till this, till this very day, guys have respect for me because of that one incident. It, it, it sounds, sounds kind of silly to have to live that way, but that's just the way the inmate code is. So that was uh, some, one of the ways that, even though it was a bad thing, good came out of it. I can't explain that, but the, God's mercy was on me. Okay, well, well, my name is David, uh, David Berkowitz, and I'm currently in prison uh, doing uh, multiple life sentences for a series of murders which happened back in 1976, 1977. I've been incarcerated for 39 years, uh, approaching the 40-year mark, and uh, my story really is uh, a story of uh, tragedy and triumph. It's uh, a story of a lot of hurt and pain but thanks to God, a lot of peace and uh, forgiveness, and 
I've seen over the years many miracles that have happened in my life, uh, in the life of uh, some of the people that were hurt by this tragedy. And uh, as, a, as a Christian in prison, I've seen God do many wonderful things in the lives of, of, of the prisoners here, reuniting them with their family members, uh, helping them to deal with guilt issues and all the things that I'm dealing with myself. So I've, I've been there and done that and, and suffered along with them. But uh, this story is really, although there are some very sad parts to my story, I believe that it's a story of, of forgiveness and hope and triumph and that ultimately uh, whoever w uh, hears me speak now or watches this, uh, that they will take away something that they never, some insight that they never knew before about uh, childhood struggles, growing up overwhelmed with periods of depression and self-destructive behaviors, as well as a you know my adolescent struggles, as well as the good things that happened because I really had a life of uh, growing up as a kid in the Bronx. I really had uh, a life of adventure there and many good experiences as well as bad ones. So it's a, it's a bittersweet story. It's like a tale of two cities. And so this is really what I want to share. And I, I really don't know uh, how to begin except to say, well, I guess I'm beginning right now, come to think of it. But um, I'd like to begin by sharing uh, a ser some portions of some letters I received a number of years ago, back in 2001, 2002, uh, from a woman who lost her daughter in the last of the so-called Son of Sam shootings. Uh, th this young woman, Stacy Moskowitz, uh, tragically lost her life in 1977. And um, of course, after I was arrested, there was tremendous hostility towards me from the public and of course from the families of victims and so forth, and that's perfectly understandable. Uh, over the years though, as I moved on with my life, having come to prison and going through the whole, this whole ordeal, it was always on my heart, especially after I became a Christian myself, to, to somehow reach out to the people I had heard in the past, to hurt in my time of ignorance. And, uh, and I, I said, God, make a way for me to just let these people know, whoever they are and wherever they are, you know, how sorry I am for what had happened and, uh, and how I, you know, pray for them and hope that as much as possible they can heal from this. Of course, no one ever fully heals from, from losing a loved one, especially losing somebody in a crime, during a crime of violence. Nevertheless, that was always one of my highest prayers, that somehow I could make peace with at least somebody from that time of my past who was tragic, who was hurt greatly. And over the years, uh, thanks to a, well, of course it was God, God that did this, but also I thank uh, a journalist by the name of Maury Terry, who was used by God, I believe, to help me to reach out to this one particular uh, person. And this is uh, Mrs. Moskowitz, Nisa Moskowitz, whose daughter, Stacy was uh, killed in that, in that last shooting. And it was a dream come true because contact was made through some friends in Georgia who had been a, a Christian couple in Georgia who might, were friends of mine and reached out to her and established a friendship. And eventually I was able to write to Mrs. Moskowitz, to Nisa, she always wanted to be called Nisa. And so I was able to write to her and we developed a correspondence and we even spoke on the phone on a handful of occasions and it was a time of great healing and everything and really this was a miracle of God. If you think about how miraculous this is, it's not something to be taken lightly. It doesn't happen every day where uh, the mother of a, of a murder victim would, would, would forgive uh, you know, the person in prison and, but this is exactly what happened and I just want to share uh, a couple of a couple of, I have a bunch of her letters and plus more that I didn't bring. This is the correspondence I had with Nisa. This, these are her letters to me. Over the time we corresponded, I, I sent her maybe a dozen or so letters, maybe a few more than that. And, uh, the, but these are some of the letters she sent me. And I just want to read portions of them because uh, they're so nice. This letter was undated, but it's around the year 2001, 2002. And it, she says here, I'm, I'm really 
I really am sorry it took so long to answer your letter. And then in another one, this is dated December 6, 2001, uh, Mrs. Moskowitz says here, David, as I told you before, I don't hate you anymore. All it got me is sickness, and I don't want that anymore. I have let, I have a lot of love in my heart, even, and I even forgive you. And when I got these, you know, these letters, it was just mind boggling to be in my prison cell, opening the mail and reading letters like this. And then she goes on to say in this letter, uh, I am sorry about my handwriting. It is really bad. It really, it is. This is, I had to underline this stuff because I'd never find it otherwise, but I can't help it. Thank you and your friends for praying for me. All, I need all the prayers I can get. And then in another letter, this is dated December 1st, this actually be December 21st, 2001. She says, Dear David, I hope this finds you in good health. I am also glad you told your father about us being friends and talking to each other. Davy, you have to call me more often as there are things I have to talk to you about. And uh, in another beautiful letter, dated November 18th, 2001. She said, Betty, that's the, the woman who reached out to her, that's a friend of mine, Betty and her husband, Rex. Betty told me you liked the letter I sent you, that it really made you feel good. Davy, if there's any way you can call, please do so. I am doing some praying here, even as I write this, I know there is, is a chance for us to be friends. It is up to you. You, ha you have my phone number, so please use it. And actually, we did call uh, a number of times. And in a letter dated January 3rd, 2002, she said, I felt great talking to you today. And uh, in another, another letter, that's, let's see, these are other letters that are undated. Uh, she said to me, David, you in your own way and is a gift is a gift from God. And, uh, and then she went on to say, with us, David, it is going to take time and patience getting to know one another. Would also like to talk to you over the phone. Sometimes the phone is easier to talk. Again, this is up to you, and here's my phone number. And she told me what time to call in the morning is the best and so forth. And as I read these things, you know, as our relationship kind of uh, blossomed uh, to an extent, it was really just something I, I can never stop thanking the Lord enough that here was this woman who was so badly injured and, even, and lost her daughter much earlier through accident. And then she had three daughters and a husband. Her husband had passed away uh, after two of the daughters had died. She lost her younger daughter. Then, of course, she, in 1977, she lost her older daughter, Stacy. but she had a middle daughter named Ricky, a, a very beautiful and attractive woman who had gotten very sick and had some kind of wasting disease and, and, and did pass away, leaving Mrs. Mrs. Moskowitz's niece with, with nobody in, in, her, in her life. She was living in Florida at the time. We, this correspondence was going on. And uh, she said, Davy, and this is, this, is, this is so poignant and so touching. She said, Davy, you and I have a big job ahead of us. We are going to teach people how to heal and forgive people. You and, you and I know some what it takes, that it may take years. But when people see it and, and, and see you and I united as friends, I know in my heart we will be doing a truly wonderful thing. Look at all the uh, healings we can do. This is what I'm saying, I'm believing, I said, I can't believe this. Here's this woman who should be so angry and want to hate me forever. And, and in the past, she expressed nothing but rabid hatred for me and justifiably so, but look what God has done. This is a miracle. She says, we need to team up and, and, and let people know about this forgiveness thing so that others could be healed and, and learn how to forgive. And I'm saying, oh God, this is like mind boggling. And she says, look at all the healings we can do. 
I could even, it could, it could even happen to your pals in jail. It could happen to anyone, any time. Wow, that was encouraging. And then one last letter here. Thank you, Davey. You are really trying to make me happy. I have not felt this way in years. Thank you again for making my dreams come true. You are giving me back my kids. I could, lo I could love you for that alone, and you will see all the good stuff we are going to do. Just remember, Davey, we are going to start a trend, and a good one at that, after all, these year, after all these years, we will start a good trend. I believe that with all my heart. I know I am smiling on the inside. You are truly making me very happy. And then she said, um, love, Nisa. And then she adds, think of all the good things as you can do. You will show people that if I could forgive you, why not other people forgiving each other? And uh, our correspondence went on for a while, and we were supposed to one day meet, hopefully we were gonna meet here in the prison. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a media person got involved in that and wanted to film the event happening live and you know, commercialize it and sensationalize it. Uh, I, I immediately disagreed to do that. I felt that if, if Nisa and I were going to meet, that it would be just private in the visiting room just the two of us and maybe some of your friends to be there just to support, but uh, that it would not be a thing for the media, you know, not be something to commercialize or sensationalize. Uh, they had promised her, you know, she was living hand to mouth uh, on social security. She was very sick at the time. She passed away shortly after this. I think in 2005 or 2006, she passed away with cancer. And my friends spent time with her. They, they actually traveled down to Georgia to visit with her and, uh, and then she was gone. We never got to meet, and she was disappointed in that because someone who wanted to do this had promised her a lot of money, but I felt that still it was the wrong thing to do. Uh, and I declined, and she was upset with that. But um, nevertheless, I believe in her heart she forgave me, and she had wonderful hopes that we could start a trend. And uh, well, that's just a miracle. That's something that happened in my life that's one of many true miracles, and I, I thank God for that. One of the things I, I love to do and always like to do was, was write. I'm just a prolific writer, and uh, I spend a lot of time in my cell when I have free moments, when I'm not in the chapel or at work or whatever, I, I, I try to get some writing done. Usually writing letters to individuals to encourage them, uh, sometimes writing letters to churches and youth groups uh, I also have an online journal, uh, riseandshine.org, uh, which is run by a friend. I don't have internet access or anything like that. But sometimes I'll, I'll send my writings to this person and, and they'll put it online because they feel it you know, touches a lot of lives. And people from all over the world actually read that. We had visitors from, from the Middle East and Africa and China. It's really amazing. It, the site's been there for a number of years, since 2005, actually. And um, so I love, I love writing a journal. Uh, even prior to that, I would send out some of my writings to friends, and over time, friends would come, and David, you know, these, these things need to be in a book. Now I was just writing for enjoyment, and also because these are things God put on my heart to write about certain things, different subjects, uh, and, or spiritual messages or whatever, mixture of all these things. And, I, and I, my attitude was, well, if God wants me to, to put these in a book form, I'll have to send somebody my way to do that because I have no idea how to do that. I never even thought about that. Well, over time, another friend did find somebody who was a book publisher and approached me, uh, a Christian man, and offered to put some of my journal entries into book form. Not for me to profit, I take, take nothing from that, but, but it, was, it was just for, to reach people with the writing. So I said, well, let the Lord's will be done. And, and a book called Son of Hope Prison Journal, Volume 1, was, was released, uh, 
I think about 2005, although it, the publisher kind of dropped the ball, it's not really available anymore. But I continue to write my online journal and I stay busy with that and uh, just reaching people. And, but I would, um, this is something uh, I'd like to just kind of maybe re read, you know, what you can put in at some point or use. Um, I wrote this, um, this is a little separate than the journal thing, but it's, it's I guess, part of the journal. Uh, I wrote this this morning uh, prior to this interview because I, I, I love writing and these thoughts came to my mind and I know that in the intensity of an interview I'd forget these things so I wanted to make sure that I had, I said this. Uh, it's titled Story of Tragedy and Triumph, Sorrow and Hope, November 10th, 2015. I think the Bronx was the greatest place to live and grow up in. It was lively, exciting, challenging, and at times scary, and so much more. This is where I grew up in the Bronx, New York City. A boy growing up in the Bronx could experience many things, some good, some not so good. The streets of the bor borough were filled with energy, a mixture of fun and danger. From my bedroom window, I could see for miles. I could see the lights of what was then Shea Stadium whenever the New York Mets played night games in town. Softball, Little League baseball, stickball, curveball, flag football, and flipping baseball cards. My three-speed English racer was my dear companion. I rode on my bike night and day. I pedaled hundreds of miles on my bikes, and this is not an exaggeration. The streets of the Bronx were teemed with people. The roof of my apartment building in, in Soundview was a hangout for heroin addicts. Stores were everywhere. Ice cream trucks visited my street every summer. The Bronx was the greatest, and in my mind, it always will be. That's where I grew up. I grew up in the Soundview section of the Bronx, and anyone familiar with that area, it was a really rough and tumble, hard scrabble area filled with housing projects, uh, working class to poor people, a very high crime area. In fact, some uh, in the 1980s, it was uh, when the crack epidemic ravaged the city, uh, it was one, the Soundview section of the Bronx, which was the 43rd precinct, police precinct, had like one of the highest murder rates uh, in the nation. And it was, that's where I grew up. It was a wild, it was a wild, exciting and adventurous neighborhood. It was, parts of it was scary. I had my good times, my bad times. I had my friends. I was very uh, athletic you know, with my energy. I was playing all kinds of ball. You know, we'd play in the streets. The ice cream trucks would come by every summer, you know, Mr. Softy and Good Humor, Bungalow Bar. It was an adventure. I mean, I, I think I grew up in the greatest place in the world. And in fact, I, th I thank God that um, I was adopted. Even though I, my parents, you know, I had hardships because my, my adoptive parents, meaning well, told me my mom died while giving birth, while, uh, giving birth to me, which the, ex, the so-called child expert said to do at the time. And I, even though I had my struggles, looking back, my life was so much better because I was adopted. My, my birth mother was a, was a wonderful, sweet lady, but she would have had to raise me alone because my birth father didn't want to have anything to do with me, you know, and she always was, was short of money and struggling to get by. So I never would have had the clothing, the bicycle, my little weight set that weightlifting set that all, everything the adoptive parents, my adoptive parents lavished on me because I was their only child. I was their love, their hope, their joy. These were wonderful people and because my adoptive parents, you know, they were in, in their 40s when they adopted me, they waited so long to adopt a child. I mean, I got treated extra special. They spoiled me, but in a good way and I, and I loved them for that. And my dad was there to nurture me and keep me in line because I was really a behavioral problem. He was the one who pushed me through school because I would have dropped out. I, I needed tutoring, after school tutoring because I had problems with my study studies. That was all the attention deficit disorder that was back then seen as, 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 as just being a, dumb, a dumbbell when really I was very, I think I was very smart in many ways. I could write real good today. I grad, ended up, even though I was in prison at the time, I ended up graduating college. I have a, a degree now, a college degree now, which I got while in prison, uh, and uh, on and on. So God has allowed me to have a life, a good, uh, under these difficult circumstances, allowed me to have a good life, even though prison life is very hard. 
there are good sides of it too, being a Christian and being able to serve the Lord. I feel like I'm a missionary living in a foreign land because I'm here in, in a tough spot representing Jesus Christ. But looking back, my adoptive, I mean, excuse me, my birth mother would have never been able to give me all of the things, that, not just material things, but just the, the attention, the time and everything that my, my, my adoptive parents gave me. They, they were wonderful parents. And so I, I really consider myself a blessed person. At one time, I thought that my birth was a curse, that I didn't deserve to live. I had that death wish. I had self-destructive behavior patterns because of all the false guilt. And now I could see that I had the best of both worlds. I had two mothers who loved me. I had my mother Pearl and I had my mother Betty. And they were always by my side, even when I messed up. Um, and my, mother, my adoptive mother Pearl died when I was 14, which was really set me off on a course even worse than I was. And it was kind of part of my downfall with truancy and, and running the streets and things like that. As a teenager, I was 14. And then, of course, after I was incarcerated, my, my birth mother died too back in the 80s, and I missed them both very much. And I, I had the blessings of having two nice families. I had the Berkowitz family, and now then I had uh, my, my birth mother's family, my sister and my nieces, and I, I missed them and loved them very much. I'm, out of, I'm long since out of contact and estranged with them because it's understandable. They, they just couldn't take what happened, and it was too much for them to deal with. I, I've, I've lost everything, you know, come in one physical sense, in an emotional sense, I lost everything coming to prison because uh, other than my, de my, my dad, my adoptive father, Nathan, was the only one who, who stuck with me all the years of incarceration, and he's passed away. And the other family, you know, they're, they're all gone, so, I mean, um, I paid a big price, but I'm living with hope now. And I, I really had the best of both worlds. I look back and see my childhood as, as, as a overall a great experience. In spite of the pain, there was, there was great things, you know, running the streets. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. The Bronx was filled with, with fun, you know, and I just, you know, thank God for the life that, I mean, I wish it turned out better. I wish these things never happened, but in spite of that, uh, when I leave this earth, I'm leaving the earth with a lot of good memories, a lot of precious good memories. I had good times growing up in the, in the pedaling my bike all over the place, Castle Hill, Classen Point, all the things that maybe don't, people don't, don't even know where that is. Well, um, yeah, I, Stratford Avenue was a great, great place to grow up. I lived in a six floor tenement building, the top floor. And as I said, from my window as a kid, I could see for miles and miles all throughout the neighborhood. And uh, a lot of great, great adventures, a lot of experiences. Yeah, yeah it was a high crime area, wild area, but my parents made a home for me and I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for everything that I experienced that was good. I experienced many good things in life. People would know that because they just focus on the crimes. And, but you know, I'm not going to allow my life um, to be defined by the crimes that happened during that very difficult time of my life when I was not in my right mind. Um, and where I had all the influences, people influencing me too, with the Satanism and things like that. You know, that was a, a tragic period. I was at a vulnerable time getting out of the army and all my friends that I knew before I went into the army had all got moved on, got married. So I was kind of like the odd man out. And uh, I was just lonely and searching for my place in, in the world and, and fell into a lot of hard times. But uh, I'm a survivor. I mean, God has brought me all this way and he didn't bring me all this way for nothing. And I believe that God had his hand on my life even before I was born. Um, I may have been born out of wedlock. People make a big deal out of it. It's no big deal to me anymore. Because as I said, I thank God for everything that happened to me because it's all worked out for the good in the long run. But God has given me, um, God knew I was coming one day and he welcomed me into this world. So even if my birth father, Joe, didn't want me, God wanted me. And, and so the story in, in some way has a happy ending, it's a happy ending.